Um, okay, so this talk will be based on uh, several papers, uh, all in very recent years. Uh, they are joint works with Arnab, uh, Eldar, Puya, and Shahar, and uh, many of the, I mean, some of the very nice ideas that I'm going to mention are from this first paper where I'm not a co-author of, and up here we extended it to this general setting. In, uh, Okay, so the common theme of these papers, or the common goal of them, is to extend uh, various nice results about property testing of graph, uh, in graph theory to, this, to uh, the more challenging setting of algebraic properties, uh, where we work with abelian groups, or fp to the n, and, um, that in that setting. So we all know what property testing is it's uh, we're given a function it can be a graph for example we can think of a graph as a function we are allowed to only uh, draw very small samples from this function so we can evaluate it on a very few number of points and by just looking at those few points we want to distinguish uh, two cases the case where the function satisfies a given property for example the graph is triangle free from the case where it's far from satisfying the property so we want to satisfy, uh, to distinguish the uh, green area from the white area. And we don't care about this gray area where the function is, doesn't satisfy the property, but um, it can be, mo uh, it's very close to some function which satisfies the property. So we can ignore just this area. Now, uh, so the reason I got into this area was that, that they've been using tools like higher Fourier analysis and regularity lemma that I was interested in. So uh, I'm not a, expert in this area, so I might uh, offend some people because I don't know the history that well, some, even some dead people, as Elhan was saying. But uh, as to the best of my knowledge, this area kind of emerged from this work on uh, linearity test by Blom, Luby, and Ronit, and uh, some other papers by Bobby Fortner. And Luna, that, that area. But there are all the results, like uh, Ruja Samaradi's triangle removal lemma, or this uh, result of Ruda. Uh, Rodel and Duke uh, from 85 that they have the same spirit, they're in the same spirit. So you can just uh, express them in the language of property testing. Uh, but the whole area or this whole notion of property testing is formally defined in the mid 90s or uh, in these two papers, Ruben Fitz Sudan and Goldrach, Goldwasser, and Ron. And uh, it's, as I said, it's very closely related to regularity. Uh, which also makes it kind of very related to the, these notions of limit theories of combinatorial objects, where you draw samples from the objects and you define some kind of a convergence notion. Uh, OK, so let's go to our setting. So by algebraic setting, I mean the following. So I'm interested, now my functions are functions from fp to the n to some finite sets, 0 to r. Here, p is a fixed prime, and r is a fixed integer. So uh, all the asymptotics are as n goes to infinity. So my domain grows by growing the value of n, not p or r. Two important cases where I care about are the case where r is equal to 1. Then in this case, we've been t we are talking about Boolean-valued <laughs> functions. And the other interesting case is where r is equal to p minus 1. And then I can talk about al functions from fp to the n to fp by identifying this set with fp. So I can talk about polynomials and those kind of, uh, the uh, functions over FP. Now, um, I was talking about being far from a property, so we should have a notion of distance. And that distance is defined by just, it's a pointwise distance. I mean, uh, the distance between two functions is the fraction of points where they differ. So F is different from G. And then once I define the distance of between two functions, I can define the distance from a function to a property, and that's just the distance from f to the closest function that satisfies the property. And uh, for testing, mo in most of this talk, I'm going to talk about this particular notion of property testing, which is sometimes referred as to proximity oblivious testing, which means that n my number of queries is just a fixed constant. It's like 5, 10, or whatever. I'm not allowed to change it according to my parameters. So 
given a function f, I'm allowed to make this constant number of queries, and I want to distinguish uh, between two cases. So if f ha satisfies a property, I, I always want to accept it, so I don't allow error here. But if f is far from the property, so if f is epsilon far from the property, then I want the probability of rejection to be bounded away from zero. So this will be some delta which depends on epsilon, but not on f. Okay, and number of queries doesn't depend on epsilon. So for every epsilon with just this fixed number of queries, I want to reject with the probability which is bounded away from zero. So you can see in this picture, if the function satisfies the property, I always want to accept it. If it's epsilon far, I want to reject it with this probability which is bounded away from zero. So let's look at the simplest possible example. My property is just being identically zero. So I'm interested in testing whether a function is identically zero. So what is a natural test? I just need to pick one point. So I pick one random point x, I accept the function if it's zero on that point, and I reject it otherwise. So why is this a valid test or valid uh, proximity oblivious test? It has just one query, so it satisfies the constant number of uh, queries. Also, if the function is zero, I'll always accept it. There's no way I see uh, something non-zero here. And if the distance is at least epsilon, it means that my function is one and at least epsilon fraction of points. Then there is an epsilon probability that I'll pick one of those points. So the probability of reject will be at least epsilon. So the probability at least epsilon, which, is, which just depends on epsilon and it's bounded away from zero, I'll detect one of these uh, points where my value is one. Uh, OK, so uh, in this algebraic setting, if I just look at uh, a generic property, uh, I'm not using anything about this algebraic structure of fp to the n. So we should impose some uh, conditions on p if we don't want to treat fp to the n as some just generic set of size p to the n. And it turns out that there's a natural and also the right kind of condition to impose, and that's that the property is affine invariant. And uh, so what, it, and this is suggested by Talik Hoffman and Madhu Sudan, uh, which, uh, so the condition is that we call the property affine invariant if it's closed under affine transformation. So whenever my function satisfies the property, then if I compose it with, um, with an affine transformation, which is just a linear transformation plus some shift, then it still uh, has to satisfy the property. So uh, a very important example of these properties are the set of polynomials. So if you have a bounded degree, degree bounded by some constant d, so if you take this polynomial and compose it with an affine transformation, it cannot increase the degree. So it will remain in the set. Okay, um, so the question is, which affine invariant properties are testable? Uh, so let's look at the polynomial example. So this set has an interesting property, and that is that it can be characterized locally. And that means that a function has degree at most d if and only if all its restrictions to affine subspaces of dimension d plus 1 also are of degree at most d. So to check whether a polynomial is of degree at most d, you only need to check it in this local way. To look at all the affine subspaces. So these are just sets of constant size, size p to the d plus 1, and check whether if you restrict to them, you'll see a polynomial of degree at most d. So one direction is obvious, the other is, again, easy but not obvious. So if, the if f has degree at most d, then of course any restriction it to any affine subspace, not even this dimension, uh, will have degree at most d. But the opposite is the interesting uh, uh, direction. So this suggests a test, which is not a priori clear that it's a valid test, that we just uh, pick a random subspace, affine subspace v, and look at the restriction of f to v. If it's at most d, we'll say that uh, accept the function. If it's not, then we'll reject it. So uh, again, we have to, why is this a valid test? One direction is obvious. If the function is of degree at most d, then we'll always accept it, because restricting does not increase the degree. But the interesting case, which, is, which needs work, is uh, that if the distance, if my function is far from being a polynomial of degree d, 
then there are many such subspaces where the function fails to have degree at most even you restrict. So when we sample the subspace at random with good uh, probability, we'll hit one of these uh, subspaces will, which will detect that the function is of degree at larger than d. Um, okay, so let's look at this general setting now, uh, not just degree, all locally characterizable properties. So we say that the property is locally characterizable if uh, it's uh, characterized by just looking at restrictions of some constant dimensional affine subspace, uh, uh, constant dimensional affine subspaces. So there exists some case such that we have this condition, that if you check if all restrictions of V, F to subspaces of dimension at most K satisfy the property, then F satisfies the property. Now, we can just try to do the same test and uh, our main, the main result of this paper, which starts with B, F, H and ends with L, is that all locally characterizable properties are testable. So it's kind of generalization, a, a very uh, powerful generalization of this testing of polynomials. Uh, and in this setting, that's uh, proximity oblivious. So the number of queries will be constant. And the test is, of course, natural. Just we pick this random subspace and check it. So I'm going to just uh, sketch a very high level of the proof, basically mention some ideas in the proof. So for that, I'm going to go to something very basic, which is triangle. I, I'll start from this very basic example, which is kind of the first, maybe, interesting property testing, uh, which has the ideas of regularity. So, so let's all recall uh, the, proper, the property testing for triangle uh, freeness. So what is the test? Just pick three random vertices and see if they form a triangle. If they form, then we say that no, it doesn't, uh, it's not triangle free and otherwise we'll accept. And again, there are two directions. One is trivial. If the graph is triangle free, we'll always accept. And then there is this non-trivial direction. So how, do we want, how does one prove this direction? It's very close. Uh, I mean, it's basically the same thing as the triangle removal lemma. So how does the proof of that go? Uh, so we start from a graph G, which we know it's far from being triangle free. We want to say that our test rejects it with some large probability. So do we proceed from here, we regularize the graph. So we using Semerides regularity lemma, we partition it into many parts. So most, uh, so this is kind of a JSTS <coughs> matrix of G, we partition the vertices into many parts. Uh, and we know that most cells will be uniform except some epsilon fraction of them. Uh, those will be non-uniform. So then there is a cleanup stage where we, we remove all these irregular parts. So we remove all the edges which are inside the irregular parts. Also, we remove the edges from the cells which are almost empty. So if there is a cell which is uniform but there are very few edges, we also clean up that one, <coughs> remove all the edges from them. Now, why is this good now? Um, so the new graph is close to the old graph. And we knew that this one is far from uh, being triangle free. So we know that this new, from that we conclude that the new graph also contains some triangles <laughs> because it's close to G. So H, this new graph, let's call it H, has a triangle. And from that, we, because it's very structured and all these things are uniform and there, aren't, there are many edges in this non-empty cells, we conclude that it has many triangles. And that just gives us that uh, original graph also had many triangles because we only removed edges from G. So that can't, couldn't create any new triangles. So this uh, kind of how one uses regularity to prove property testing in the f most obvious case. Now let's look at something more interesting, which is uh, now I look at uh, the property of not containing a cycle of length five as an induced subgraph. So now here, there are also non-edges that I care about. So I don't want to have edges between certain vertices. So the test is, again, natural. Just pick five vertices and see what happens on those five vertices. And so, again, we want to show that if my graph is far from being induced C5 free, then uh, I'll detect there are many induced C5s in there. So I'll detect them when I test with these five vertices. Now, if you look at just the previous proof and try to just replace triangle with C5, we have a problem. That is in this cleanup stage. When we remove these edges from these cells, 
we might create new cycles of length 5, induced cycles of length 5. So when we remove these things, this might create some new cycles of length 5. So the fact that this new graph contains many induced C5s doesn't imply that the old graph also contains many C5s. And um, so this proof fails. But to overcome this, uh, uh, Alan Fisher, Krivilevich, and Segedi, they proved some variant of regularity lemma which suited for this purpose. And uh, in, their regular, in their regularity lemma, they have two partitions. So one has this original partition, which is uh, denoted here by this orange um, lines. And then there is another finer partition, uh, which refines the original one. Uh, so there are two A and B. Now, also for every uh, part in the, or in the course partition, we pick one representative sub part. So for example, here I picked this first one in this second one and so on. Now, uh, the, they showed that one can do this in a way that now if you look at these green cells, which are just between these subcells, they're all uniform. There are no exceptions. So all of these pairs are uniform. Uh, and that most of them actually represent the, the bigger cell that contain them. So if you look at any of these big cells, for most of them, they have the same den almost the same density as the subcell inside them. Now, why is this good? Um, so there is a way of just modifying now this big graph using this small uh, cells or this representative cells, such that if you find something in the big graph after modification, you can just look at these small ones, and they're very uniform, so you can find many copies in the original graph. So I'll talk a bit more about it in this setting, which I'm interested in, the algebraic setting. Uh, so remember, we wanted to prove that every locally characterizable property is testable. Um, so the general steps are the same as the, uh, as the graph case. So we start from a function which is far from being, uh, uh, far from satisfying the property. So there's epsilon distance to p. Now we regularize it. So we partition it so that in a nice way we can handle things by just looking at this partition. And then we modify the graph or this cleanup stage where we change things to f only a small modification. And we obtain a new function g, which is close to f. And because g is close to f, it will not satisfy the property. And so it should violate some local constraint. And these local constraints and the fact that g had this nice property, one can use it to show that f also should violate many copies of that local property, so the test should work. So that's the general step. Um, so the first step is regularization, uh, as I mentioned. Now, instead of graph, we have this function over fp to the n, and we want to decompose it in a nice way, um, so that f is uniform on most parts. So how does the partition work here? Uh, so here we are more restricted, because we are looking at this affine restrictions and we want to preserve those kind of distributions. So we should uh, partition them according to polynomials. Uh, affine invariant, uh, yes, and to just 0 to r. Yeah. Now, uh, the partition is go going to be defined by polynomials, so I have, if I have constant number of polynomials, q1 to qc, from fp to the n to fp, all of degree at most d. Then I can partition my group or my vector space according to these polynomials in the following way. I'm just going to look at the values of these polynomials. And um, so this is just a vector in fp to the c, which is just a finite set of constant size, in fact, where c is a constant, and decide uh, according to this, uh, so it kind of induces a partition on the whole space, according to these values. So if you have quadratic uh, functions, you'll see these quadratic uh, structures and so on. Now, OK, so that's the partition. And it has these properties. Uh, if you take d large enough, it's possible to do it so, so that we keep the same distributions when you do approximations with this kind of partitions. Now, uh, now. The usual regularity, again, has this problem, that the same problem that we saw when we worked with induced C5. So we need to prove something similar to 
this regularity of Alan Fisher, Krivilevich, and Segedi in this uh, algebraic setting. So that's the main challenge. Um, so we need two partitions again. Uh, so the first partition will be defined by some polynomials P1 to PA. I want to refine it to get a second partition. So the natural way to refine it is just to add more polynomials. So I'm going to add more polynomials Q1 to QB to this, and that will give me the second uh, sigma algebra or the, the finer partition. Yes? Uh, so every set of polynomials defines a partition. So I have two partitions. One defined by this. this. Uh, there is a bound on the degree. No, it's not the same degree. So, so all of them are bounded. The degrees are all bounded by some constant, which comes from the, um, the dimension of the vector space, uh, the local characterization. Okay, so <coughs> the, now I want to find subcells that represent the, the bigger cells. So, uh, so let's look at, for example, this uh, atom of the this core sigma algebra. I want to pick some subatom which represents it. So it has the same densities with good probability, and also it's uh, uniform. And it turns out, so one of the nice ideas, which is kind of a core idea, which was from this first paper that I'm not a co-author of, I mentioned by uh, Arna Belder and Shachar, is that all these subcells should be picked by just a fixed vector. So I'm going to pick a fixed vector C0, and for e each one of these atoms in the core sigma algebra, I'm going to look at the subatom which corresponds to setting Q1 to QB to this fixed vector. So I, I can't just do this arbitrarily, just pick one cell here, from here so that the densities are the same. So it's really important that all of them come from the same, chosen by the same representative vector. So why is this important? Uh, because we are, after this, doing this cleanup, we'll find some affine structure in this coarser sigma algebra. So something in this partition, something here, something here, and so on. But we want to be able to find the same thing in these subcells, because subcells are the ones that we know they are all uniform. Right, so uh, the fact that finding something in this big, uh, in this core sigma algebra also implies that you can find the same thing in this fine small subcells uh, follows from this fact that we, we made sure that all of them are represented by the same vector. Okay, so what is the cleanup stage? Uh, this is the same as the graph case. So we want to mod remove all the irregularities and unpopular values. So uh, the way it works is that for each one of these small uh, atoms, we denote by TC the, the most popular value there. So there are different values there, and it, uh, TC is the one which, uh, which appears there most often. So, and the modification is that if there is an irregular cell in the big, uh, in the core sigma algebra, we just set every there, everything there to this popular value. And also, if there, is, uh, if there is an unpopular value in this small cells, I'm going to set it again to TC to something popular. So this first one is like in triangle removal lemma, it's like uh, removing all these irregular cells. And this second one is like emptying this, uh, the atoms which were, uh, had very few edges. So those uh, the same two things. Uh, no, but the popular value is from the small subcell, right? Yeah, F two times. Yeah, that, that's just. So this new function that I obtained is close to the original function, so it's not in P, and so I'll find some uh, affine subspace such that if I restrict my function to that, it will violate the condition. So this affine subspace will be something here in this core cell, and then I can just find many of those by looking at these small green cells. Uh, so F will have many copies of W, w that will violate the condition. So that's how the proof goes, the outline of the proof. 
So actually, the main contribution uh, in this paper that I had, the, the second one, is we. So all these ideas were in the original paper, but the, we needed some kind of equidistribution theorem for these polynomials uh, for small values of p. Uh, so I'll tell you what, in a second what that means. So how does the proof go? We approximated f by looking at this partition. So we are approximating f by a function which just looks at the values of these polynomials, uh, which correspond to the partition. Right? Yes, so, uh, yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, how, how to work with this. I mean, it wasn't even clear why these polynomial uh, partitions are useful, why we're working with polynomials, right? Uh, no, no. So, okay, I'll tell you what, what it is. So we do this partition, and it ha uh, like by doing using these Gauss norms and uniformity, we know that this approximation works. But then I'm gonna select. I'm gonna look at these restrictions of f to affine subspaces. So I want to analyze this thing. I already know that instead of f, I can do it with this gamma. But how do I? How do you analyze? restrictions of this gamma to subspaces. So that's what I want to say. There you need the, uh, this kind of equidistribution. So I'm picking this affine subspace V uh, on k dimensional. So let's denote its points by L1 to L p to the k. It's a constant number of points. Now, well, I'm looking at uh, gamma applied to this q of these points. So basically, I'm applying gamma to the rows of this matrix, Q1 of L1 to Qc of L1, and so on. And I want to analyze this. So to be able to do that, I need to understand the distribution of this matrix for these polynomials that define my partition. Matrix. So green tau for large values of P, and then uh, Tali and Shachar for small values of P, they showed that if this polynomial satisfies uh, some condition, which is called like high rank condition, which I'm not going to define, then if you pick a random x, q1 to qc of x will be almost in independent. Right? So which this also corresponds to the fact that this partition will be almost an equipartition. So what does that tell us about the distribution of this matrix? It tells us that all rows are almost, if you restrict to a row, the entries are almost independent. But that's not enough for our purpose, right? We want to understand the joint distribution of this entries of this matrix. Uh, and we can't expect to have this kind of independence. And the reason is that there are some restrictions which come, or dependencies that come from degree conditions. For example, if you have a polynomial of degree 1, then it always satisfies this condition, that if you have four points, which L1 plus L2 is L3 plus L4, then this identity holds. So the value of QL4 will be determined by the, the value of these three other points. So there are some dependencies there coming from uh, these degrees. And what one wants, to, also, it's not just degree one, right? You can go to degree two, then you can take discrete derivative, so you get some identity on eight points, and so on. So what one wants to prove is that these are the only dependencies. If the polynomials are of high rank, then the only dependencies that you see are the ones that are coming from just, just degree conditions, up to some small error, of course. And that's what, uh, with Shachar, we did it for large values of p. Uh, and then uh, in this paper, uh, for small values of p, so when you go to small values of p, you have to replace actually polynomials by some non-classical polynomials, which are not so nice to work with. And, uh, but we can prove uh, such a statement. But we had, it works for affine systems of linear forms, which was what we needed here. And more recently, uh, we got rid of this affine condition too. So we have just, just a general case where you have some systems of linear forms and um, you want to understand you're saying that if these polynomials are of high rank, then we understand all the dependencies. This is really a basic thing, and it's 
not just for property testing. If you work, if you want to work with these things and do higher order free analysis, that's really what you need to be able to. It's kind of like understanding how characters work when you apply them to uh, linear structures. But so can, you say, can you still say the rank is high? The rank uh, is high. It means that any linear combination of them. Uh, so it's a polynomial. You can't write it as a function of few polynomials of lower degree. Right. So a, a high rank quadratic is a function, a quadratic polynomial, which you can't write it as a function of few linears and so on. So it kind of generalizes that. So in some sense, it means that they are generic polynomials. OK. Uh, and OK, the, the next thing I want to talk about is that, so what are the other examples of locally characterizable properties or other natural <coughs> examples? Uh, so one example that we saw before was just a set of polynomials of degree at most d. We can generalize this to something which we call degree structural properties. So in, uh, now I have a degree sequence, d1 to dc, and my function satisfies the property if it can be written as in this form, some gamma of p1 to pc, where gamma is also fixed. And these polynomials are of degree at most di. So if C is 1 and gamma is just the identity function, I'm going to get this polynomial set. But I can get more interesting sets. For example, the property of being the product of two quadratic polynomials, or the property of being a square of a quadratic polynomial, or the property that my function can be expressed in this form, AB plus CD, where A, B, C, and D are cubic polynomials. And uh, we showed that every degree structure of property is locally characterizable. So if you look at any of these sets, it has a characterization that uh, your function is in the set if and only if restriction it to some fixed finite, all restrictions of it to some finite dimensional subs affine subspaces are, have the property. Actually, surprisingly or annoyingly, our proof uses regularity. We approximate f in this thing and then we go from there. And because of this, we really get, we really don't get any bounds on the dimension. So if you look at these properties that I had here, using our proof, you don't really know what this k is. You get some kind of inverse Ackermann type of bounds for the dimension that you need to look at. So it's, it's really desirable, I think, to find a direct proof which doesn't go through regularity. And I think. Uh, dependency on p, you mean? Or, um, I don't know. We consider it a constant. <laughs> no, no, we haven't thought. I mean, we haven't thought seriously about. It. But yeah. So don't know. Degree. Yeah, degree was the uh, one. Yeah. So uh, need to talk. Up. So uh, the notion of testing that I was talking so far uh, was this pro proximity obli oblivious, where I just allowed constant number of queries. But a more general uh, notion, which is very interesting, is now I, I can allow number of queries to depend on this epsilon. So it's same as above. So I want to accept the function if it satisfies the property. So it has this one-sided error thing. It doesn't allow error here and reject uh, the same thing as before. But now number of queries can depend on epsilon. You can also look at two-sided error regime, where you also allow to make errors here with some probability. <laughs> and one of the beautiful results in this area is this result of Alan and Shapira, that every hereditary graph property is testable in this setting. So hereditary graph property means that it's close undertaking um, induce subgraphs. So if you restrict your graph to any uh, number of vertices, then if it, the original one satisfies the property, the subgraph also should satisfy it, the induced subgraph. For example, bipartiteness has this property. And uh, so let's try to see if we can come up with something similar in this uh, fine invariant properties. We call it, well, the natural hereditariness here is to restrict to affine subspaces, right? We're working with uh, sampling affine subspaces. So we call the property affine hereditary if it's, uh, 
if a function satisfies it, then all any restriction of it to any affine subspace should satisfy it. Uh, like the degree at most d case is an example of uh, affine invariant uh, hereditary property here. And there's this conjecture to, to Arnab, uh, Grigorescu, and Shapira uh, that basically just the same conjecture, the same statement for graphs is stated in this, side, uh, in this setting, that every affine subspace hereditary property is testable with one-sided error. Now, uh, what we proved is that if you, again, uh, I can't really be precise here, if your property has this bounded complexity condition, and here bounded complexity is something which is studied by Julia, by Gavers and Wolf, that your, your distribution is controlled by some uh, Gavers norm. So you can do these approximations, uh, your function with some partition defined by polynomials of just some bounded degree. So that maximum degree that you can put there is called the complexity of your property. So uh, what we proved is that if, you have, if your property has that bounded complexity condition, then uh, you're testable. So in particular, locally characterizable functions have that bounded complexity. But uh, I'm kind of, I'm not sure if I believe this conjecture, uh, because if you don't have this condition, then it means that you can't really, I don't see any way of working with this kind of regularity and approximating your function uh, with something that works with your distribution. So we all know that, for example, three-term arithmetic progressions, you can prove, like Samaritan theorem for three-term arithmetic progressions, you can prove it using triangle removal, lemma four-term, using uh, hypergraph for three uniform hypergraphs, and so on. So there is this one-to-one uh, -one kind of correspondence between what you can prove in this algebraic setting and the hypergraph case. And if you don't have this bounded complexity, it kind of means that you have to work with general hypergraphs with no uniformity condition. And it's hard for me to believe that you, this statement might be true. Although, I mean, it might be for some reason that I can't think of it's true. But also, I can't construct any counterexample. Yes. No, that's another thing. It's very hard to even construct things which are not of bounded complexity. Like even random, you can construct them randomly, but yes. Is the linear system that corresponds to Goldbach's conjecture. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I don't know whether that can be translated into anything. So that seems to be a hard <laughs> problem. <laughs> um, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's a very good open problem, I think, probably the most interesting one. Uh, so I'll just mention the remaining time. Um, just uh, one more result that suppose you have a property P and some constant, non zero constant. Now think of, don't think of alpha as something very small, it can be like one third or something. Then P sub alpha is the set of function with distance at most alpha. So you kind of make this property fat by looking at everything which is in distance at most alpha. There's a result uh, due to Fisher and Newman from 2007 that says that if a graph property is testable, then this P alpha is testable for any alpha with two-sided error. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that you can estimate the distance from a testable property. And we proved the same thing for uh, affine invariant property. So if it's testable, then you can test uh, on this. Um, yeah, so testing uh, P alpha kind of corresponds to seeing whether the distance is at most alpha or not. So you can estimate the distance. And this was unknown even before this, even for simple cases such as cubic polynomials. What is the, can you estimate the distance of a function to a cubic polynomial? Uh, so let me just tell you what the test is uh, without giving the proof. Suppose I have a function f. I want to estimate its distance to a given property. I'm going to pick a huge affine, random affine subspace. So it's of constant dimension, but it's, this constant should, is going to be something very large. And then uh, we'll, the test 
I mean, the, uh, the fact that test works is that we can show that then the distance of f restricted to w from the property is a uh, good approximation of distance of the original function from the property. So this doesn't hold for any all properties. It holds for testable properties. Uh, so it has two parts where if f is alpha close, then fw can't be very far. And if f is far, then f, f restricted to w can't be very close to p. Uh, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, and instead go and uh, talk about open problems. Uh, so, I mean, as I said, the main, for me, the most interesting problem here is that is every affine invariance, uh, affine subspace hereditary property testable, this conjecture uh, of uh, Gregor's school and Shapira. And another open problem that I've already mentioned was that finding a direct proof that without using regularity that degree structural properties are locally characterizable, uh, which hopefully will give some reasonable bounds. And the other problem, which I've, something that I've been thinking about on and off from my PhD time, is that suppose you have a function from F2 to the N to F2. Then we know that, uh, so for those of you who know what uh, uniformity norms are, that using Garrett's U4 norm, you can uh, distinguish these two things, whether your function has correlation with a non-classical polynomial of degree 3, or that its correlation uh, is very small. So if you, if you can estimate U4 norm, then you can estimate the correlation of the function with this non-classical polynomials, cubics, using, I mean, it follows from the inverse theorem for these. Um, so this is not exactly the testing setting that we had before, because the inverse theorem says it's a very crude estimate. If you know U4 norm, you know that your correlation is between this and that. Um, so, but the interesting thing is that this has only 16 queries, just uh, just if you write the U4 norm. And the interesting question, I think, is that can you find a test for cubic polynomials? So can you make some number of constant number of queries and distinguish between the case that your function has um, negligible correlation with cubic polynomials or some large correlation with cubic polynomials? So the the U4, this is the natural test which people use for cubic, and it fails here because of these counterexamples to the original inverse theorem. Yes? Here, number of queries is constant, right? There, it depended on epsilon. Uh, uh, which the, the main result that locally characterizable? No, but, but here I'm not interested in seeing whether uh, I'm cubic or far from cubic, right? Here it's the correlation, it's not, so it's like distance half and distance half plus something. Uh, so the only things are that we know are the things come from Gauss norms, so they provide such a test for something, right? The correl through inverse theorems. That if Gauss norm is large, you correlate with something, uh, and if it's small, you don't correlate with that. So the, basically, the question is: Is there such a test or such a norm or uh, system, sets of systems of linear forms, which provide something similar for cubic polynomials? And Quick clarification. You, you, you're proposing to replace non classical cubics with cubics? Yes. yes. Okay. But then U4 norm doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. It's a non expert. Can you give some intuition why is the graph case looking like, why is the, the algebraic case looking like the graph case, not like the hypergraph case, in terms of the stance of the results that you make? Uh, it's more like hypergraph case. It's so more like hypergraph? Yes. So the results, I mean, in terms, but you cannot prove all of the results. There isn't an analog of all of the results that you showed for hypergraphs, so there is? There is, yeah. I just started with graph because it was simpler to. Yeah. 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 Ye
and your results don't follow from the hyper result. No, results. no, that's uh, yeah, they don't. Symmetry book is different. Just yes, it's more complicated. Regularity is more complicated. So in the hypergraph case, for some properties, weaker regularity suffices. Right? For example, this new proof of the time of the new model. Or some graph removal uh, by Jacob Fox. They don't need the full power of the regularity. Lemma. Mm, and yes. in some sense, they prove, a, they prove a weaker version of the regularity lemma that suffices for counting some graphs. For triangle removal. The graph case, right? Or is, is that? Yeah, but it generalizes to hypergraphs and subgraphs. Okay. So, and they don't need the full power of the regularity lemma. Do you, have you have you considered such a weak, weaker regularity notion, which might give you other properties? I the problem with this is that uh, like uh, when you go to work in this algebraic setting, the inverse theorems don't have any good bounds. So there is really no. I mean, the, the, I guess the, the point of those things is that they, they provide better bounds. Here, like... So that was, that was the main point of the work. But yeah. in some sense, it, all it says is that you only need a weaker notion of regularity in order for these properties to go through. Right. Right. It, it does give you a better bound, but, but, yeah. but it also it works... It gets a better bound because it works with a weaker notion of regularity and not the full power of it. I, I'd say what you're using is actually already quite a weak notion of regularity there, um, because we don't understand regularity in the algebraic setting well enough to have these really strong quantitative mm -hmm. beyond the quadratic case. Were there questions or comments? What about other symmetry groups? Yeah, I mean, the, there is also the just Z n case, right? The cyclic group, which I haven't heard about, and it's there, it's the partitions are even more complicated. You need to work with these new sequences. Okay, let's thank for that.